Welcome back, Cam to Catholic. I have not seen y'all on a flip in a hot minute. And I know some of you are like, it has been a long time since I've had a flip. It's also been a long time since he's given us marbles. Look, I can't give you marbles during these presentations, all right? Like, we got to just keep pumping through them. But speaking of pumping through them, it's going to help us move quickly if we do this flip now, all right? So speaking of that, it also gives some fluidity so we can kind of bang these things out by Wednesday and then kind of move on and do our thing. Uh, to say the least, I am ridiculous ridiculously impressed by some of y'all's presentations. Big shout outs go to people like uh, Nicole Douglas. He did a great job. Jules Norris. Um, I know that Nigel Pedro did a great job yesterday. A um, lot of different kids. That those three just kind of particularly are standing out in my mind right now, but very, very solid work so far. Keep it up. I know all of you have been doing great. I don't think anybody's really lost that many points on it at all yet. Like, uh, man, y'all are kicking butt. Just keep it up. All right, keep it up. Now, this is where we left off in content before we started our presentations, right? What, remember what I told you in class, though. I want you to skip a couple of pages. So where you've got your arts going right now, unless you're doing them in a separate notebook, I want you to like skip a couple of pages and then pick up on what we're about to talk about now, all right? So we've talked about architecture, sculptures, paintings, frescoes, blah, 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 all these other amazing things that returned with that, what's that keyword again? That means studying secular things and understanding the world around us. Good job, Dom, I heard you. Humanism, right? The humanism perspective of the Renaissance and understanding, like returning back to that Greek concept of like, why is the sky blue? Not because of just secular theologic reasons, right? It's due to all kinds of other scientific things that we might not even understand, right? But returning to the idea that men and women can create and make something amazing, right? So we stopped when we talked about our early 1300s, right? We talked about Dante, the Divine Comedy, and his early works as a writer. But he did not stop, or like, writing didn't stop there. So we got to talk about two other big writers that came around during the Italian Renaissance, which is what we're in right now. And their names are Baldassar Castiglione and Niccolo Machiavelli, all right? So speaking of these guys... This guy is prominently displayed in my classroom, right? That is Baldassar Castiglione. Say it with me one time. Baldassar Castiglione, right? Baldassar Castiglione wrote a very, very influential book, all right? He wrote this thing called The Courtier, right? The Courtier, which was a guide to how we should act in this new world of the Renaissance, right? Because it is different. The Renaissance was wildly different from the Middle Ages, right? Some of you are like, it doesn't seem that different. Well, I gotta pull my shades up. It's a little dark in here. Um, so, now, anyway, there we go. It's also just gross and rainy outside and all this other stuff. Now, ah, so, now, anyway, but the big thing about it is, is that the, the Renaissance is wildly different, right? You're walking around and, like, Michelangelo might walk past you in the street, right? The One of the biggest and best artists that the world had seen up to that point. Possibly that the world had ever seen up to that point. Um, or Europe, anyway. Let's not say world, because you know, these very different art forms. Um, so, but you gotta act different. It's a different world, right? So he called his book The Courtier, right? And what a courtier is, he's an advisor to a king, right? He's the guy that, like, you turn to when you don't have the answer, right? The courtier is supposed to be the man of the court life who resembles, like, like just everything a good man is supposed to be, right? So it's a guidebook to behavior. And he believed that the ideal man, according to Castiglione, is supposed to be like athletic, but not overactive, right? Good at games, but don't gamble. You might end up losing something, right? Plays a musical instrument, knows history. A lot of these things sound like Mr. Terry. I'm just saying. I can't play any good instruments. I can do this, though. And so take that. All right, now, anyway, the big thing, though, knows literature and also isn't arrogant. So I guess I'm out with that comment that I just made, right? So must not be very Renaissance man-like, but it's a very good like like alliteration. He said the ideal woman also, according to Castigliani, which is kind of like sexist that he's saying these things, but again, it's the 1515s, so it's like, uh, graceful, kind, lively, but reserved, beautiful, offers balance, right? So, but the courtier is a phenomenal, like phenomenally important text. It began to be, like, eventually became to be, like, what the nobles, like, later on used to use to teach their children on how to actually perform more in society and be more of an active role player, right? But then we're going to keep going forward, and then we meet this guy, Niccolo Machiavelli, right? At, comes after Castiglione, and he wrote a very huge book called The Prince. And I don't know if I can hammer home hard enough how important 
the prince is, all right? The prince is crazy important. The prince is literally hmm, considered by many today to still be the key text when it comes to how a government is supposed to operate, right? So it's supposed to explain how government should rule, right? And he always used this example in his book of this prince, right? This prince, and he mapped it up off this guy named Cesar Borgia, who's actually the illegitimate child of a pope at the time, but we're not going to get into that right now, all right? So his famous quotes are things like, the ends justify the means, all right? Now, I want you to write this down. I know it's not on the slide, but listen closely, and I want you to put a big box around it because it's very, very important. His eternal question in his, prince, in his book called The Prince is, is it better for a ruler to be feared or loved, right? And it's been like a, it's even playing out in our current day politics, right? Is it better for us to fear or love our leader? Which one is it? Is there such a thing as respectful fear? Is there such a thing as like loving respect? You know what I mean? Like all of these other different ideas, right? Now, he concludes later on that fear is the actual answer, right? Fear to the point that you should actually be afraid of what he's capable of. However, he also says that he ought not be hated, right? Because if you're hated... They're going to push you out, right? So, but Niccolo Machiavelli's prince is wildly important. But here's the thing, though. The other thing that's going to happen is the Renaissance. Is it going to stay locked in Italy? No, right? So there are two parts of the Renaissance when we're talking about it here. Two, you have the Italian Renaissance, which are all the artists that we've been talking about up to this point. And then you have the Northern Renaissance, right? My Northern Renaissance cats that haven't gone yet are people like Hier Hieronymus Bosch, Albrecht Durer, Jan von Eyck, right? Like all those guys, okay? And so the Renaissance spreads north through trade and it ends up adapting to this idea. Well, some people would argue that that actually isn't true because like Jan von Eyck was making stuff like before Michelangelo ever did. But the Renaissance is going to spread, right? So you have your Northern Renaissance, you have your Italian Renaissance, right? So the Northern artists though are very, very different, right? Um, some were persecuted for their works in Italy, so they ran to the north in places like England and France. But Northern Renaissance work is very different. And a lot of it has brought off the ideas of this right here, this printing revolution. So there was this guy, this German, right? Some of you are like, why are we going so out of order? This doesn't make any sense. Just know for a fact that the Renaissance spread north, and it's mainly because of this thing, right? This printing press invented by this guy named Johannes Gutenberg, right? He creates the printing press and originally prints the very first printed version of the Bible on it, right? The, the reason why this is so important is he took two great things, an old Chinese model of a printing press that was actually made out of wood, though, and he changed it and he made his out of metal, right? Now, metal printing presses were better because they didn't soak up all the ink and they actually stayed for a lot longer and they were much more durable, right? Now, also, though, he took the fact that the Muslims in Northern Africa had perfected a way of making paper very quickly and very cheaply. So at the perfect time, Johannes Gutenberg creates this thing, the printing press. Now books could be made cheaper and they expose classes to literature. Not all the classes, because most people in Europe still couldn't read. But like the wealthy could, right? And why is it important that the wealthy can read at this point? It's important that the wealthy can read due to the fact that they're the ones buying and selling this art, right? And actually pushing the economies for it, okay? So it's exposing them to literature. And literacy, literacy rates are going to shoot up following this point, all right? So going from like very few people could read, like your theologians and priests, but now regular people could, well, wealthy regular people could read. Most of your poor still couldn't read or write. Now, artists, back to them, right? So the northern artists are wildly different. After this printing revolution and all these things keep spreading and people start seeing pictures and pamphlets of things where it's like, oh my God, what's going on in Italy? Northern artists are going to depict very different stuff. They're going to depict scenes of more like real people. They didn't like to do as much religious stuff as much. They like to kind of put like regular people in their works. They like to do like portraits or uh, engravings was a big thing of different animals or things that might just be a little bit outside of like Christ necessarily, right? Now, a lot of that is due to the fact that they felt, probably felt that the market was oversaturated with it. But northern artists were very, very different, right? They depicted real people, poor people, merchants, wealthy, different types of religious scenes, not ones that just, like, kind of envelop the ideas of Greek or Roman myths or Jesus, right? So, which is very, very important. Now, and they did all of this right here. Underline that. Immense detail, all right? Speaking of immense detail, this has been a very detailed flip. 
So I'm going to stop right there. So you see, it wasn't that much. We just had to kind of like make sure that we're ready to go push in our Northern Renaissance artists without batting an eye at it, right? So very, very good job. Thoroughly impressed with what you guys have been doing. Keep it up. And now for a lot of you, this is your chance, if you haven't gone yet, to get up to those Trevor Chaputs, Andrew Preetz, uh, Omars, uh, Michael Alvarez, all those guys that have gone already and shown you what's up, right? Now you can actually make sure that you're on their level. All right, so like, take this chance, take this opportunity to make sure you're ready for your presentation. I will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend. Go Birds. Let's go. I hope you all have a great weekend.